condition that makes things objectively valuable is that they are attached to or related to or utilized by a goodwill. So that's the thing which is itself good without condition and itself is the condition that makes other things good. So I've said this just before, but we can think of uh, a good will um, as someone who has, has a will that wills its ends properly. It chooses correct ends and pursues them in the right way. And finally, the last thing I want to say just about this first sentence uh, is that although this isn't quite true to Kant, here's how you should be thinking about this. The thing which is good without qualification, this idea of a good will, you should be thinking of it as a person. You should be thinking of this as a good person. A person who wills properly, chooses her ends properly, and pursues them properly. Now, this isn't quite true to um, Kant, perhaps, because maybe God as having a good will, maybe angels. Maybe you want to say they're people, they're persons, too. But in our ordinary thinking about this, this is a human being. Someone who pursues ends and uh, gives herself ends and pursues them. And when we give ourselves ends properly and pursue them properly, that's what it means to have, that's what it means to be a good will. So notice that um, this is a certain, as it were, perspective on human beings, namely viewing them as agents, viewing them as actors. Um, and that is what is a good person, a good person viewed as an agent, as someone who, almost, someone who wills ends properly. That's what's good without qualification. Um, and one more related point about this. Do not, at all costs, do not think of the will as an, maybe an organ in our body, in our brain, for example. Um, it is a will, is a person viewed from the point of view of agency viewed from the point of view of someone who does something. And this is why Kant says, right at the beginning, nothing in the world or indeed beyond it. So there's nothing, that, look, we don't have any empirical experience of a will. We don't have any sense impression of freedom. But this is something that we attribute to people when we view them as agents, when we view them as responsible for their conduct. Okay, questions about all that. So this is a lot packed into this very first sentence here. Um, questions about that? For sure, we haven't yet seen anything about the alleged content of a good will. It's just one that wills properly, whatever that means. Okay, so we haven't yet seen any kind of argument yet. This is the first sentence. So we obviously haven't seen an argument yet for this claim that this is the thing which alone is good without qualification. Okay, continuing. Understanding wit, judgment, and whatever else the talents of the mind may be called, or confidence, resolve, persistency of intent, as qualities of temperament, are no doubt in many respects good and desirable. But, he says, they can also be extremely evil and harmful 
if the will that is to make use of these gifts of nature, that is, the person who has these qualities, and whose distinctive constitution is therefore called character, is not good. If the person has a bad character, those qualities are not good. So talents of mind, he says, and temperament are only good, they are good sometimes, when they're connected to a good character, a good will, and, and as a good person. Um, so uh, Kant here is apparently referring to the Stoic view. And the Stoics held that wisdom and courage and prudence were three cardinal virtues. Um, and it seems to be that these are what Kant is referring to. But notice that <clears throat> he interprets these in non-moral terms. They, these qualities, wisdom, courage, and prudence, as Kant interprets them, may be features of um, a bad person, character that's not good. And so then he claims that they are not good when possessed by a bad person, a bad character. And notice that he doesn't include the fourth cardinal virtue that the Stoics talked about, justice. Uh, this is something that can't obviously be interpreted in non-moral terms. Um, so he leaves it out. Um, if we think that justice is, in fact, um, unconditional virtue, if we think that, in fact, justice is always a virtue, that has to be because it's an aspect of goodwill. That has to be because, for Kant, it can't be part of a character that doesn't have a goodwill. And that, in fact, is what it's going to um, argue when justice is understood in a certain way. OK, so we don't think, well, so we'll, we'll see what this is here. So um, further down, um, it's the same with um, it's this, just the same, he says, with gifts of fortune, power, riches, honor, even health, and the entire well-being and contentment with one's condition under the name happiness. These inspire confidence and thereby quite often overconfidence as well, unless a good will is present to correct and make general these purposes their influence on the mind. And furthermore, a rational and partial spectator can never more take any delight in the sight of the uninterrupted prosperity of being adorned with no feature of a pure goodwill, um, and therefore that a goodwill thus appears to constitute the indispensable condition even to the worthiness <coughs> to be happy. Okay, so in addition to um, talents of mind and temperament, it says gifts of fortune, things like happiness, are often, we might say, useful instrumentally, like money can be useful, wealth can be good, can be useful instrumentally, um, but only truly good, only objectively good, when used to pursue ends that are proper. Um, so, while um, so while gifts of nature are maybe internal qualities of a person, gifts of fortune, we're just talking about here, in an important sense, are external. Um, and notice that, so like wealth or happiness uh, or power, notice that these are, in fact, useful and valuable, but only instrumentally so. These are useful in achieving certain ends. If you have tools or you have money, they are good for accomplishing your end. But whether we say that they are good beyond this merely instrumental use depends on the ends that they're put to. Um, and it turns out that the condition which makes those ends good 
and therefore the tools or instruments that help us achieve those ends good. The condition that makes the end good, and therefore that makes the tools or means good, is that those ends are willed by a good will. Willed properly. Okay, I'm going to say something about happiness in just a second. Right, so happiness. Um, so, first of all, notice the sort of implicit definition of happiness here. So happiness is um, something like the, satis the feeling of satisfaction in accomplishing our ends or goals, something like that. Um, and so, first of all, notice that it's uh, subjective and it's empirical. It depends on the desires and inclinations that we happen to have. Um, so this is not something, so uh, the identification of what will make us happy, what will make us feel content or satisfied, is not something that can be done purely a priori. It depends on our natural inclinations and instincts and desires and urges. And that's something that's a matter of empirical investigation. Okay, but, but isn't the satisfaction of our desires always a good thing? Isn't the satisfaction of our desires something that's unconditionally good? Um, the answer, I think, for Kant is that the satisfaction of my desires, my desires, does in fact always seem good to me. So I think Kant would say that from my point of view, from my subjective point of view, when I have a desire or an inclination that's satisfied and I feel happy, that certainly does seem good. But of course, as I emphasized to you, we're not talking about, Kant isn't interested here in simply what seems good to somebody. He's interested in what really is objectively good. And those are not the same here. Um, we might put our question this way. Um, so happiness, as I say, always seems good to the person, but it's not always objectively good. And this can be revealed, Kant says at the end of this little passage here, by considering the rational impartial spectator. So this is like an objective third party perspective who maybe is perfectly rational and perfectly impartial, not concerned simply with its own desires. And this rational impartial spectator um, does not think that all the satisfaction that, that for every desire, its satisfaction is objectively good. So let me say one more time. It may seem to be good subjectively from the point of view of the person whose desire it is. Um, but it's not always objectively a good thing. It's not always objectively a good thing for somebody to be happy. That is, it's not always objectively a good thing to have someone's desire satisfied. Kant would say it depends on the desire. It depends what the desire is for. So, I mean, I gave an example of this a few classes ago. So this is, I mean, this is at the heart of Kant's view. Right here, we have to get clear on this. I mean, I'll give you the contrasting case. So a utilitarian would say, start with Hobbes. Hobbes would say that nothing is objectively good. The best that we can do is have sub the satisfaction of subjective desire. A utilitarian is going to say that all of this, those subjective desires count as positive objective goods. Sometimes they conflict with one another. And so